Thank you, and good evening. I'm so glad you're here at the Asia Society on this cold, cold night, and I hope you will come back often. Uh, we are ha really, as you just heard, very pleased to have this particular panel together, uh, mostly because they represent very, very different sectors, and they represent the best in their sectors. I will briefly introduce, first of all, Chelsea Foxwell in the middle, and you are very we're honored to have her here because she is the co-curator of the exhibit that you that Meiji Modern, uh, and she is the co-author. I hope you will all. You can't see the exhibit anymore; it's closed, but you can buy the catalog, which is amazing. Uh, and Chelsea is an associate professor of uh, art history at the University of Chicago, and she's also the director of the East Asian Studies Center there. And she wrote a book on a similar um, similar topic called. Um, making Modern Japanese Style Painting. So we're very happy to welcome you. And then Takako Tak uh, Takotani, a political scientist, is a senior fellow with the Asia Society Policy Institute, APSI, by nickname, in Tokyo. And you can see her monthly column called Takako's Take on, on the Asia Society website. And the latest one is actually on the, the Noto earthquake, the recent uh, January 1st, New Year's Day earthquake. So I recommend that. Uh, she's a professor at Gakushuin University in Tokyo. She visits other places around the world, and she was my colleague at Columbia for five years until uh, 2021, uh, teaching political science. She's taught also before that for years at the uh, National Defense Academy in Tokyo, and she is an always astute commentator on Japanese politics and foreign relations. And Paul Schurd is very well known as an economist, and certainly, I, if you don't know his best-selling book, you should, in addition to buying the catalog, you should buy this book. <laughs> it's called um, The Power of Money, uh, and it's, it's, it's very, it's always timely, but, <laughs> uh, but it's a very good book. Uh, he was the vice chairman of S&P Global, and he's taught at universities around the world, in Australia, in Japan, in the United States. He twice served on the uh, Economic Deliberation Council of the Japanese government in the 1990s, which is unusual. So he is your guide tonight to all things Japanese economic. And with that, we're going to start with some brief remarks from, by each of us from our particular perspectives. We'll talk a bit among ourselves, and then we invite questions from the audience. So my job, I'm a historian, is to start with some reflections on how change happens in Japanese history, both in the Meiji period, uh, in the 19th century, and now. It's the title of our, is from Meiji to now. Uh, so I will begin where all these people always begin, with the Meiji Restoration of 1868, which is known as the founding event of modern Japan. Well, what was it exactly? Hmm. In 1868, the shogunate system, the Tokugawa shogunate, fell. It was not overthrown, it fell. The last shogun resigned. Uh, and the emperor, who was then a teenage boy, who didn't know how to ride a horse, was restored to rule, even though his predecessors had held no power for centuries. The boy emperor was immediately heralded as a direct descendant of the sun goddess, who represented a mythical imperial line unbroken since antiquity. That is the imperial restoration. This ringing in of the old was followed in very short order by a cascade of reforms, which abolished the feudal domains, it abolished the samurai class, it established a national capital, Tokyo, a national education system, a national taxation system, a conscript army, and a host of reforms of everything from the castles to haircuts uh, in five years, 1868 to 73. This is the Meiji Renovation, okay, which is the name used in Japanese for the Meiji Restoration. The emphasis is on the new, okay, the Meiji Renovation. It's Meiji Ishin in Japanese. And this curious but very calculated mix of old, mythic old, and new, the most up-to-date new that they could think of, uh, 
initiated what amounted to a revolution, a kind of political earthquake, if you like, uh, which brought seismic shifts in practically every corner of Japanese life, institutional, social, economic, cultural, everything. The beginning of modern Japan. Now, there are two things I want to say about this iconic event, which I'm going to de-iconize, I think, a little bit. Okay. The first, it was not a single event, uh, but what, what might rather be called the long restoration, a lengthy, tumultuous, even chaotic historical process, which began in the 1820s at least, well before the American black ships arrived, and lasted through the, the 1890s, well after the Constitution and Parliament were established. And this underlines the importance of what I call pre-existing conditions. I don't mean medical. I mean what Japanese society looked like at the, at the moment of the supposedly all at once modernizing reforms after 1868. Because it was in fact changes that had taken place over the previous shogunal decades, while the Tokugawa shoguns were in power, that set the conditions of the possible for Meiji modern. And the long restoration also means that it took decades after 1868 for institutions to develop, for the old and the new to mix and to gel, for people to find their footing in this shifted tectonic ground, and some never did, in other words, it took a long time for things to settle into their modern shape. So the long restoration is most of the 19th century. And the main agent of Japan's modernity in these long Meiji years after 1868 was less the state which mandated the reforms and took all credit for them than society, which actually implemented most of them. I give you the example of the education system. The government decreed there will be national public education in 1872. And then the local elite built and paid for the schools, paid for the school teachers, and the peasants of Japan ponied up money for the school fees for their children. It all took place in the villages and the towns. Uh, and this is very important because the government Everybody thinks the Meiji state did all this. Nope, not true. Uh, and the second thing about the long restoration is that Meiji modern took the shape it did because of what I call available modernities. And what, by that I simply mean the existing versions of the modern at the time that Japan made this modern transition. And for Meiji Japan this time was the last three decades of the 19th century, when modernity went by the name of civilization, it's the word in Western languages and in Japanese, which Japanese of the time and others in China, in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, in many places, saw as, I think this is very important, I'm gonna underline this, saw this civilization as a universal stage in world history a universal stage, which demanded, for example, a unified and sovereign nation state. Yes, it was epitomized by what Japanese of the Meiji period called Euro-America, Obe, but it was considered the way of the world. It was the way of the world. That's why Japanese modernity looked the way it did in the Meiji period. And so the East-West contrast that, that the Japanese used all the time and that we still use is quite misleading because the commonalities of 19th century modernity, civilization, were not confined to new nations, new centralized nation states like Japan, Germany, or Italy. Old nations like France were doing, undergoing the similar changes in order to adapt to the 19th century version of the nation state. This is the, what, what civilization demanded. So while Meiji Japan was nationalizing the state and its people, 
France, at the very same time, between 1870 and 1914, was engaged in transforming peasants into Frenchmen. So this means that Japan was not a catch-up or a late modernization, nor was it an imitation of the West as the West. But as Meiji Japanese repeatedly intoned, it was a mantra of the times, this was an enterprise in line with the trends of the times, that was the terms, with the achievement of civilization as the world then, which was dominated by Euro-America, defined it. All right, what does this long restoration and Meiji modernity reveal about how change happens in Japan? Again, I would make two points. First, as in the long restoration, a great deal, and I contend more than in other places, in Japan happens, a great deal of change happens during long periods of incremental change, such as occurred in those decades before the Meiji Restoration, which gave that pre-existing conditions. Uh, in effect, one might argue that the dramatic reforms of, the, of Meiji Restoration and the following renovation were already underway during Tokugawa, which helps to explain, by the way, why the events of 1868 did not produce a social or political upheaval. Well, they might have, right? Um, the same is true of the radical reforms after the Second World War in 1945. General Douglas MacArthur did not bring democracy to Japan, although he liked to claim he did, um, through uh, the occupation. But like the end of the shogunate and the establishment of the Meiji state in 1860, after 1868, Japan's defeat in war and the occupation did propel and enable changes, major changes, after 1945, most of them built on earlier developments. And these changes did indeed, again, seismically, change the landscape of post-war Japan. Now, now, uh, Japanese and the rest of us, I would add, are living through a rather long period of historical transition. At some point after it's over, it, the period will be given a name. But for now, we don't know how it turns, it's going to turn out, and it has no name. But one thing is certain. Whatever the future turns out to be, a lot of it is already happening. That's the way history works. That's why iconic events do not happen and change things between a night and a morning. Now, this is true everywhere. But for Japan today, it suggests that we ought to pay very close attention to the incremental changes that have taken place since the 1990s, especially. Mixing the old with the new, in society, politics, culture, and foreign relations. And although foreign observers like to claim that Japan has been standing still, or worse, since the recession of 1990 began the so-called lost decades, in fact, Japan has changed a great deal in the last 30 years, in its political economy, in its social patterns, in its proactive foreign and security policy, and what may seem like recent departures have actually been occurring bit by bit since the early 90s. Second, and again, as in the decades of modernizing change during Meiji, after the Restoration, most of these ongoing changes now are socially based. So don't look to the Liberal Democratic Party or the government, but to Japanese society if you want to catch the current winds of change. And because of the primary importance Japanese attach to social relations, or more precisely, their disinclination toward social disorder, incremental changes that mix the old with the new, as before, and slowly, as before, also account for Japan's social stability. So I'm not going to predict Japan's future, but I think it's a pretty fair guess to say that, that the now more than 30 years of considerable incremental change since 1990 are likely to continue, unless that is something shocks the system, most probably from outside Japan, 
which is what happened before the Meiji Restoration in the mid-19th century and what happened with the defeat in 1945. That doesn't happen, historically speaking, the patterns of change that we see in Meiji, we also see now in the long and ongoing history of modern Japan. And with that, I will turn it, the podium over from the historian to the realm of art and the art historian and ask Chelsea to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Shavia. I don't know, Shavia <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Carol. That was amazing. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's such an honor to be here on this panel. Uh, so today, I'd like to talk about the World's Fairs and maybe their trajectory uh, between Meiji and now. So what you see on, the, on one slide is the first World's Fair that the Meiji government participated in uh, or organized a participation in, which was in Vienna in 1873. In Meiji Modern, we have one object from that exhibition. I'll show you in a minute. And on the right is the architect's rendering by So Fujimoto of uh, the colossal wooden uh, ring-shaped pavilion that is currently being erected in Osaka uh, made out of wood. So um, the notion of kind of tri mixing arts and industry, and also, you know, Fujimoto claimed that in this structure, he's, he's combining, you know, traditional wood joinery techniques with uh, new things, I think maybe, uh, I don't know if it's glue lamb or some kind of laminate or, or mixing of, of multiple small boards and new technology. So this mixing old and new technologies, mixing arts and industry uh, was a strategy that we see in Meiji Japan that was conditioned uh, by the culture of the world's fairs. So we know that the Meiji government was assiduous about image management. So um, in contrast to, I think, for example, Qing China, which delegated the World's Fairs to kind of commercial vendors, um, the Meiji government decided from the beginning that they would invest the funds into using the World's Fairs as a major uh, public relations initiative for both public policy and the cultivation of exports. And so... These exhibitions also got replicated uh, domestically within Japan um, to serve messages to domestic viewers. I'm just noting the time. So um, let's see. So what I'm showing you here is um, one of the uh, one of the early World's Fairs that uh, I think the earliest World's Fairs that uh, was visited by a Japanese delegation when it was still the shogunal era. And so this was the 1862 London International Exhibition, and there had been a shogunal delegation uh, who was in London, and this, you know, just a few years after the um, establishment of uh, the normalization of relations um, between Japan and these the so-called great powers, including England. And so uh, the delegates from this uh, shogunate, shogunal exhibition didn't fail to note the machinery and weaponry that were displayed as spectacles of military and economic might in these great glass and steel halls. And so, and you could see like two, two types of spectacular, gigant, enormous guns, uh, the Armstrong gun, the Gatling gun. Um, but uh, by contrast, the same delegates noted that the objects which the British had chosen uh, to represent Japan, so basically Japan had been unwittingly entered into this exp exhibition without their knowledge, uh, as historian a uh, Angus Lockyer has noted, uh, that the Japanese objects were described by the Japanese delegates as this miscellaneous heap of objects from kind of an antique shop or a curio shop, and that it was painful to see that, you know, straw sandals and straw raincoats after you had just seen you know, the Gatling gun um, or then the, Armstrong, the cross section of the Armstrong gun. So um, in the course of participating in different world's fairs, Japanese officials and arts administrators uh, developed this finely honed sense of how success at these mass spectacles depended on the display of this kind of a perfect balance of artistic, industrial, and military prowess, right? You needed kind of the arts uh, to balance out the industrial, you know, the rawness of this kind of, in, uh, of the industrial and military kind of messages 
but the World's Fairs, which were patterned on a type of exhibition that uh, had been developed in Napoleonic France, right, to stimulate industry and trade, you know, both within the country and outside the country. Um, it, it was al always this balance between the arts and, and kind of industry. So in the early Meiji period, um, so this is the drum that was exhibited at the Vienna International Ex Exhibition. You have to remember there was no word for sculpture, so they are translating the exhibition catalog and to trying to figure out what categories they can actually submit to the World's Fairs in. And so, you know, certain things such as a, a ceremonial um, drum uh, was, you know, became kind of sculpture, became an art object overnight. And so um, this, when this early World's Fairs, we get this sense that, okay, so Japan is underdeveloped and what we ha in the way of machinery and, tr and industries, but what we have is mostly handmade goods. And so this idea of almost using the spectacular quality of very fine hand craftsmanship as a, um, as a way to substitute for uh, the lack of having the cross section of you know, a gigantic gun or something like that. So um, these high, extremely high quality and refined objects um, were, were selected and were, were produced. And of course, the artists were told you should make something that is as intricate, as detailed, and as refined as possible. And these were the kinds of words that were given to them. And it was up to the artists to try to figure out what they were going to exhibit. So uh, furthermore, arts could be a means of mentally processing and symbolic responding to this cutthroat world of jakuniku kyoshoku, or this kind of social Darwinism, right? The, the strong eat and the weak become food. And so you can see this little sparrow that's being carried away by a hawk and that was in Meiji Modern and these giant tigers. And the artist declared that he was making these tigers to symbolize Japan. Uh, so uh, that in the artist's mind, at least these tigers were supposed to represent uh, Japan for the, on the world stage. So due to its size, we were not able to exhibit this uh, colossal tapestry, 12 by 18 feet, at the Asia Society here in New York. But it will be on view in the Meiji Modern Exhibition in Chicago and Houston. So uh, in here, for scale, you can see the conservation inspection for this work, just how how huge this was. So I started researching this work because I was literally just impacted by the enormous size of this. So um, what I had on this was that this was a, a present to the widow and son of the US Secretary of State, Walter Q. Gresham, an Indianapolis man. Um, and you know that he had died pr uh, pretty suddenly. And so this gift that was intended for him was sent to his, his uh, widow by the emperor, so by the government of Japan. And that this is a hand-woven silk tapestry but it, from Kyoto, from the Kawashima Company, but it was described as being a Gobelan tapestry by the, the government <laughs> official, the Japanese government official of Kurino. So uh, why was this described as a Gobelan tapestry? Well, maybe I need a longer, longer talk. You know, basically Kawashima had gone to Europe to study um, mechanized looms and also to learn how to make velvet and brocades and things that you need for big Western style buildings. And he, um, he encountered this beautiful hand woven pictures. And so um, he carried on this within Japan, these hand woven pictures. And so uh, it was given to this, the secretary of state. Why not the president? Why was it given it to the secretary of state? And can you even imagine transporting this? How do you get this to Indianapolis in 1895? <laughs> and as soon as it got to Indianapolis, they sent it right, right to Chicago so that it could be exhibited at the Art Institute of Chicago because it was so amazing. So this tapestry was actually part of an end, the end game of the first Sino-Japanese War, which concluded in 1895. On December 8, 1894, just days after Japan's decisive but um, unfortunately excessively violent seizure of Port Arthur on the Liaodong Peninsula in China, the U.S. Senate back in Washington ratified a new U.S.-Japan treaty that represented a major symbolic victory for Japan. This was the reversal of the so-called unequal treaties of trade and diplomacy. 
So uh, I believe that uh, I've been going through Gresham's archive in Indianapolis, taking advantage of my proximity in Chicago, and I believe that this tapestry was a, uh, a mark of gratitude for the Secretary of State's assistance in kind of Japan's image management in the United States during this very sensitive period of the of the Sino-Japanese War. Um, so, um, and, and actually this word civilized that Carol used, Japan was um, assessed as carrying out an efficient and civilized war to the extent that that term could be used to describe a war, said, said an American official. So um, this, this gift of tapestry was accompanied by two huge vases of, of doves, right? This is a nice peaceful motif of doves. And so um, I believe that what Meiji Japan established was that the arts not only compensate for a weakness, but they also ameliorate or smooth out um, geopolitical competition and tension. And um, to, they were operating in a biased world where uh, Euro-American Orientalism was very often not something that you could change directly, but it was, the arts played a very important role in kind of indirectly um, managing um, opinions uh, of, of Japan um, in the United States. Uh, so today, idealism and social dreaming are, are an important part of the world's fairs. And so even though in Japan, this colossal wooden structure is making headlines because it's now uh, reported to be double the cost of the 2020 uh, construction estimate, um, so, uh, but there's, there's also the architect's words. Um, he talks about this pavilion as a oyane, a, a giant roof over humanity. And he's also adding a lookout tower. He says he wants to bring people closer to the sky. So, um, you know, this, and also World's Fairs are full of firsts and biggest, and this is the, supposed to be the largest freestanding wood structure. Um, in the world, and it, like I said, it uses this blend of traditional and innovative construction methods. So when I think about the legacy of the World Fairs and their status today in Japan, I leave you with the question, what are these colossal displays accomplishing that is perhaps not so easy to accomplish by other means? Great, that's the end of my presentation. Now I turn things over to Takako, uh, Takako uh, Hikotani. Thank you so much. Um, it is a great honor to be here. Um, and it's a good remembrance of what I first came to Asia Society for was in 2018, where I was um, a panelist for an event on, um, on um, democracy and political development in Asia, which was to commemorate the 150 years since major restoration. And, um, and I think of that because now I'm happily affiliated with Asia Society. And that, um, but I just remember that I had a much more difficult time thinking about how exactly to commemorate Meiji 150 because it wasn't something that was spontaneous on people in people's minds, but it was something that was led by government. And I had to say something relevant about that. And I think right now, although it is not something that is per, like mentioned by the government, there is a sense of, changing history and some kind of momentum and an end of an era mm -hmm. in Japan in a way that it wasn't now. So it's actually more relevant to talk about that topic. Um, also, um, just for the audience, just um, a quirky piece of information. I teach at Gakushin University, which is also an um, interesting Meiji modern <laughs> kind of school, and that it was established in um, 1877, or the 10th year of Meiji, to educate the imperial family and the aristocracy to um, to lead the way in modernizing government and Meiji government. But one thing that I've discovered after being a Gakushun is that it actually didn't really start then, but it actually started in Kyoto. And when they, the, they wanted to have a head start because they knew that this change of government was happening. They knew that the aristocracy or the imperial, extended imperial family are going to be in charge. So they wanted to prepare for- Before 1868. Yeah, or they were, so it's something that happened before. And it's very interesting. And if you think about the old and the new, um, uh, we had to reinvent ourselves after the war because we no longer have an extended imperial family. But there are some aspects of old that still preserve in, this, in, in one sense that the princess still goes to our school and she's a senior. 
um, and she'll be graduating. And I'm sad that I wouldn't be able to mention that the princess goes to my school. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, so what, what do I mean by this sense of history that is emerging and is much talked about? Um, people have noted that um, from the pre-war period, as we know, it lasted for 77 years from 1868 to 1945. That is the end of World War II. And people noticed that it was actually 77 years from 1945 to 2022, which was two years ago. And it didn't really occur to people that it's been so long mm -hmm. since uh, the end of World War II, because I think that tends to be talked about as one post-war single, and major restoration seems pretty far away. Mm -hmm. But it's how long we had the post-war period, and there has been questions about what kind of era we're entering. Um, at the end of December 2022, um, there's a famous TV commentator called Tamori who uh, was asked in this talk show, uh, what kind of a year do you think 2023 is going to be? And he said, I think it's going to be the new pre-war. And he didn't really elaborate on what he meant, but that, that expression caught on. Because I think it, there was an interesting agreement among those who didn't agree on the political spectrum about why it seems like the new pre-war the more people on the right wing thought that it's actually an awakening of the Japanese government or, or, or the Jap Japanese people, that maybe there is war and maybe we have to not be as pacifist and be wishful thinking, that there has to be this sense of urgency about preparing for a war and the world is more unstable. But those on the left used an expression of more about hesitation about how things are changing, that the worry that Japanese democracy could be sacrificed at, at, the, at the expense of the government who is trying to implement measures that is to prepare for an emergency to be impending. So both ends thought that that word, that um, terminology or that word hit a chord in a way, and that has become sort of much talked about topic. It became sort of a special um, edition of Sekai, the liberal lead magazine had a major feature on Atarashi Senzen or the new pre-war. And all along the way, I was always curious what Carol would think, because um, <laughs> um, she, you are my professor, and that I am worried about what I'm going to say now, whether what she thinks at the same time. But uh, I do think that my point here is not that I agree with that statement, but there is the sense of history that, um, or change in a way that didn't happen at the 150 at Meiji, but actually right now going on. And I think that um, unintentionally kind of is a good follow-up to what uh, uh, Carol was saying about what kind of change we're having. And I think I haven't been able to see the exhibit because I was in Tokyo and I wasn't here until two days ago, so I couldn't make it to the exhibit. I'm very envious of many of you who must have been at the exhibit, but I had a chance to look at the wonderful catalog. So I'm assuming that um, things here, um, many of them were on exhibit. And, that's, and I'd like to talk about what I thought about the, um, not just the book and exhibits, but also the essay that you, you provided there. Uh, um, Chelsea. And all that, I thought it was very important to know, um, or I was really reminded of what are the themes or consistent themes when we think about change in Japan, and what are the debates that we have. And I think there's a really interesting parallel between the debate that took place at the Meiji Restoration, the debate which took place after the war, and what we're having right now, which are two concepts. One is the first-rate nation, what that means, and the other is synchronicity. Um, and the Meiji era, as I think lots of the artwork displayed, um, had a lot to do with Japan wanting to catch up and become a first-rate nation, and how the efforts were made at the government level, foreign policy, military, and cultural, to try to present itself as a first-rate nation. And I think in different ways, though, um, post-war era was somewhat similar, that in a way, it was trying to regain status as a first-rate nation after defeat of World War II. And the preamble of the post-war constitution includes a, um, a phrase that says, we desire to occupy an honored place in international society. Um, and so striving for the preservation of peace and abandonment of tyranny and slavery, oppression and intolerance for all time from the, path, uh, from the earth. And so it meant a lot for Japan to join the OECD. Uh, it meant a lot for Japan um, to be part of the uh, the G7 and being the only Asian country in the G7. So Japan was trying to gain its status and to have the first rate uh, status. Mm -hmm. And that was very important. And so although post-war meant many things, as Professor Glecka says, I think this first rate nation is, is something that was aspirationally 
always there. And the other is the synchronicity, too. I do think that there was effort to bring in technology. There was effort to be more like the West or to present itself as a democracy, to be a rightful citizen of what they thought to be the post-war era. So um, what now then? Like, what do I, why do I think that these two concepts, the first-rate nation, or maybe I could just say status for the sake of making it both SS, the status and the synchronicity is very helpful. I say that because when you think about, when I reflect on the discussions that were taking place in the Meiji 150 or before that, um, it was really about trying to be a first rate nation once again, and that discourse was very present. In 2013, Prime, uh, late Prime Minister Abe made the famous Japan is back speech at Center for Strategic International Studies, where he said, Japan is not and will never be a tier two country. I am, I am back and so shall Japan be. Mm -hmm. But in some ways, saying that showed that there was a sense that he has to say that because Japan may be no longer or may not longer to be understood as such or no longer to be seen as aspiring to be such. And I think that was very interesting that that's what he said and that led to the major 150 to be presented in a certain way. But I think that also right now we see more ambivalence about the, two, the top tier, the, the first tier nation um, um, description. Um, there's a magazine called Bungei Shunju, which readership is mostly um, more um, senior, had an interesting um, article recently with the title saying the, the great, great power mentality of the older generation is not helping. <laughs> And that um, the younger generation, there's a, there's a conflict between the great power mindedness, which I think is a first rate nation orientedness mm. of the older generation, and the younger generation who basically has given up on that concept. Mm. And that that has been sort of the struggle that we're having, mm. and that the older generation basically is not helping the younger generation. And that I think is one of the concepts going forward because I think there is gonna be change, but it's not gonna be towards expansion in Japan. Because there's debate about the relative decline of Japan, but I think what's for certain is Japan is shrinking. Mm -hmm. And that by 2040, um, the working population will shrink to 80% of today. And that's, all, that's in the next 14, 16 years. So that's coming very soon. Already, 29% of Japan's population is over the age of 65. And what I think if you have seen coverage, of the Noto earthquake, you might have noticed that because more than 50% of the population um, there is over the age of 65, but that's happening in the entire Japan. And it's not happening at equal pace, it's happening more rapidly in rural areas like Noto, and also it's not happening equally at the gender level, that more women are leaving the rural areas than um, to urban areas. So what I see as what Carol mentioned is that the social change is already happening in these kind of demographic shifts. Um, and so how to continue to occupy an honor place in international society if Japan is trying to be a frustration nation is going to be more complicated about what exactly. And I think the recent changes in spending more on defense looks like it might be the typical great power model, but I mm -hmm. think the demographic reality is something that needs to be kept in mind. But also that there has been changes at the government level that uh, sort of went beneath the surface that has been to strengthen the prime minister role. So there are changes in the system that we haven't seen, which we haven't seen it as a chain of error, which might lead to that. Um, and the second part is synchronicity. And that also, I think, is a good way to look at the societal change. I think synchronicity is happening um, at, in sort of a different way. One, I think there isn't like a typical one ideal way of the world or the world does not seem to be going in the same direction, and Japan is not too sure whether or not it should stick with what they have or to see other ways of the world. And so it's not really certain what the way of the world. The, the modernization process is not as uni, um, linear as we, we would want, maybe. Two, um, it's happening with other countries. The level of synchronicity of the Japanese young people with other countries in Asia is rather remarkable. We tend to think as an older generation that they, they, we want them to aspire to go abroad. And abroad, we tend to think the US or Europe. But I think the level of familiarity with outside countries tends to be more Asia. Yeah. Um, there's an annual song context in Japan that happens called Kohaku Dagasen every um, January, I mean, December 31st. And with the level of 
Korean singers and groups taking part and how it's completely indistinguishable with the Japanese singers was quite remarkable. And that being acceptable um, and promoted as a good thing is something that we haven't really changed, so that's very different. The other is that the synchronicity is happening, not maybe necessarily a people movement, but through online exchanges. And people know more about the rest of the world than we do. Finally, there are people shifts too. There's a lot more foreigners living in Japan than before, and there's a lot more Japanese people living abroad. Um, the, um, although there are relatively few compared to other countries already, um, more than 10% of residents of Tokyo, to, uh, Shinjuku, which is one part of Tokyo, is foreign-born. Um, foreign and that, um, that is happening at a more rapid speed than we expected. And we need that because we don't have a working population. And so altogether, I do think that things are happening. And that um, thinking about Meiji does not necessarily help in terms of like checkpoints of what we need to mo modernize. But when things happen and change happen, it happens in a way um, that we might not see. But I do definitely see some change from what we knew as the post war happening, not because it's been 77 years, but I do think there's fundamental shifts in Japan and important questions about where Japan is in the world, which is the first great nation is, and also how the Japanese society might be synchronized with the rest of the world. So thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Over to me. Thank you very much, Carol. And uh, first of all, congratulations to Chelsea and the Asia Society on a wonderful exhibition, um, which I had the pleasure of seeing a couple of weeks ago with my family as well. Um, it's a great achievement, and I'm very pleased to hear that it's going around the country as well. And secondly, Thank you, everybody, for braving the cold weather and uh, filling this room tonight. Uh, that's also a remarkable achievement. So what I want to do in a few brief remarks is um, sort of look at the Meiji uh, restoration through an economic lens. And there are three key words. One is opening up, another is institution building, and the third one is entrepreneurship. So um, obviously the Meiji restoration uh, and of course the, the 10 years that preceded it from uh, when Commodore Perry arrived in uh, 1853, well, more than 10 years, uh, with his black ships, was a process from an economic point of view of, of Japan opening up. It was a little bit like you might call it globalization at the barrel of a gun. And of course, <coughs> economists um, you know, like opening up. They like uh, to see the benefits of trade. They like to see the benefits of ideas, capital, technology flowing around the world. And so from an economic point of view, um, this is really the first significance of the Meiji uh, Restoration. And of course, it had a political angle, as Carol touched on. Um, but from an economic point of view, it was really Japan bringing down the barriers, maybe being forced to bring down the barriers, and opening up to the world, and therefore getting a lot of the benefits of that, and of course, benefits for the rest of the world as well. The second aspect, though, which I think is, um, is often is downplayed by economists, but is really sort of taken for granted, but is really, really important, is the building of these institutions. Uh, and the Meiji period was very much about uh, institution building, of course, to a certain extent, copying, or not so much copying as choosing from a menu of institutions that existed in the West. And Carol has touched on this. It's a long, long list, uh, building a central government, building a central bureaucracy, uh, building an education system, uh, building a, the, all of the infrastructure of a modern economy, a banking system, a centralized currency, the yen, um, a central bank fairly early. The Bank of Japan was established in 1882 based on, of all things, a Belgian central bank model. The legal system, uh, really taking uh, a cue from the civil code in Europe, particularly Germany and France. So one could go on and on. Building this, this complex of institutions, modern framework, uh, that then provided the basis for economic activity. Uh, joint stock companies, for example, as well. A tremendously important innovation introduced into Japan. The third aspect, though, which I think deserves to be emphasized, is the role of entrepreneurship. And one of the forms of entrepreneurship, of course, was the political entrepreneurship, that you had the so-called Meiji oligarchs who were transforming the nature of government in Japan. And of course, if one were to throw out one name there, it would be Ito Hirobumi, uh, who graces, of course, the 10,000 yen uh, Oh, sorry, that's 
Kazao Yukichi uh, Ito uh, Hirobumi, obviously the first prime minister, the kind of author of the Meiji constitution, which came somewhat later, I guess it was 1889 or something like that. A little bit later, took a bit of time. Um, so you had this political entrepreneurship. It's not, a, you know, we don't normally consider entrepreneurship and politics in Japan in the same breath. Uh, the second kind of uh, entrepreneurship, if you like, was this sort of more cultural entrepreneurship. And again, the name I'd throw out here is on the uh, 10,000 bill note, for the time being at least, which of course is uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi, founder of Keio University. But there was a lot of... Uh, and this is really more in Chelsea's world than, than mine, but this kind of cultural uh, entrepreneurship going on as well. The third part of entrepreneurship, of course, was the economic entrepreneurship. Um, and if one were to use a name here, it would be the person who is soon to grace the uh, 10,000 Ikimai and Satsu <laughs> in Japan, of course, is Shibasawa Eichi, who's often called the founder of, mo of Japanese capitalism. And again, it would take too long. We'd chew up all the time to go down the list of the things that just this one person uh, brought to Japan. Um, but he founded something like 500 companies. He introduced double book, uh, double entry bookkeeping. He introduced the concept of, and I'm looking at Deputy Consul General Ito here. He, of course, spent time uh, in the Ministry of Finance. Um, and he left there, founded the first note issuing bank in Japan uh, very early on in the Meiji period but was really pioneering all of these, uh, these entrepreneurial activities, a long list. And then, of course, you have the Zaibatsu. Once you have the joint stock companies and the ability to form holding companies, uh, of course, we have the famous Zaibatsu. Now, a couple of them, Mitsui and Sumitomo, had their roots in the Edo period, but the new ones were Mitsubishi and then later Yasuda. But probably a list of 14 or 15 other smaller Zaibatsu. These Zaibatsu are these uh, industrial complexes with a holding company, usually founded by some kind of entrepreneur. Uh, it's kind of vertically integrated in the sense of having presence in many different sectors of the economy. So these Zaibatsu in particular were driving a lot of the uh, economic activity in Japan. So you don't, those three components, the opening up, the building of institutions, but then a, a set of entrepreneurs who drove uh, these things, they all interacted uh, in, 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 in a sort of complementary synergistic way. So that's kind of a, an economic lens, if you like, on the Meiji uh, period. Just to kind of bring it a little bit closer uh, to the, the now, the modern, I'll just make a couple of points, which have, I think, already been uh, sort of anticipated by the comments from, from the other panelists. One is that the, the economic significance of the Meiji Restoration, when you look at the sweep of history from then to now, is not so much that this provided a great sort of economic growth spurt for Japan. Um, there's a famous uh, English economist called Angus Madison is deceased now, but he did a lot of famous work of trying to reconstruct GDP, sort of economic growth statistics for the world going back centuries. And if you rely on his numbers, it looks like during the Meiji Restoration, Japan grew at around about an annual rate, a compound annual growth rate of about two and a half percent. The US in that period was growing at about three point, close to four percent. Um, UK a little bit less than Japan, Germany a little bit more. So, you know, Japan was growing at a decent rate, but nothing too spectacular. Japan's really high growth uh, period was the post-war period from around about 1950 to the early 1970s. And the cumulative average uh, of a compound uh, average growth rate in that period was a little bit above 9%. So that was really the growth spurt. So I would look at the Meiji restoration from an ec a sort of economic history uh, viewpoint as being more about building this foundation of modern uh, economic infrastructure, which is, of course, enduring and uh, shaping Japan uh, you know, today. The second point that I would make is that this has been anticipated already, uh, but you know, we, we arrived at our comments independently, so we're kind of lining up on some, <laughs> some conclusions here, is that the big transformation in Japan was not just the Meiji Restoration. There were others as well. And of course, two big ones, I would say. One, one big one, perhaps a little bit less visible. The big one, of course, was the post-war uh, reforms, which, again, were kind of analogous in many ways to 
the Meiji Restoration in terms of the transformative impact um, <clears throat> on the economy, education reform, constitutional reform, land reform, um, economic reform, the dissolution of those zaibatsu, uh, antitrust reform to decon uh, so-called economic deconcentration, uh, a whole swath of the top management in Japan were pushed out uh, of, uh, of their jobs and new, new managerial positions were created for people to move into. So very transformative, which set the stage for the, the post-war rapid growth. The third uh, period, though, is really from the 1990s onward, and particularly in the 1990s, but it's been continuing, which, again, is a long, long list of quite potentially, not perhaps bearing much fruit yet, but potentially transformative shifts in Japan. Um, I mentioned the Zaibatsu, the Zaibatsu dissolution. Well, in 1995, Japan re-legalized holding companies mainly to help the banks out of their non-performing loan problem. Um, but now you can have holding companies in Japan. This was just one aspect of a catalogue of changes to corporate governance in Japan. I won't go through the list because of time. Um, financial Big Bang. And the big reform shifts really happened under Hashimoto, uh, Butaro. Not usually thought of as much of a reformer, but he, under his administration, you had the six big reforms of mid-1990s, including administrative reform, financial reform, social security reform, education reform, etc. Then, of course, Koizumi deserves some credit for the continuing that process. And then, of course, we had the Abenomics period as well. So below the surface, there's been this quite uh, active and cumulative process of sort of rewiring the institutional fabric of the Japanese economy but it's been sort of overshadowed by this concept of the lost decades. But I think looking forward, uh, despite the population shrinkage, the labor force shrinkage, and maybe that gets reversed at some point, uh, I think the seeds are being sown of um, some perhaps positive things happening in Japan. Maybe it will take an internal shock, maybe an external shock, but I think some interesting times might be in, in store. Thank you. Yeah, we did not coordinate our comments, so we must be right, right? I mean, <laughs> corroboration. Uh, it's interesting how much we uh, echo one another. We don't, let's take a couple minutes, but not too much, so we have time for the uh, questions. But just a couple, to pull out a couple things that are in common and ask you how you, um, how you as panelists evaluate them. So there's a theme that goes through that you could call Japan in the world. That's the first great the, f the first rate country or the we're going to use the um, the world's fairs uh, mm -hmm. to get to for good publicity and we're going to show people I'm from Chicago I grew up I grew up next to that building oh, wow. and we grew up yes <laughs> and the wooded the the, the, the Japanese uh, tea house on the wooded aisle yes uh, so it was working already into the, <laughs> the last part of the 20th century anyway so the Japan in the world the 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 uh, first rate status and that's one uh, theme, and I think we're, we're clear on that. We're also clear that it might be changing. The second thing that I hear is the sense of history or the seeds of something happening or uh, the, the, the third, possibly a third change since the 90s that you talk about. So this is what I call this period of historical transition. There's an uncertainty right now because so much is changing. Here too, okay. So uh, that's a second theme that that and the the sense of history that you talk about. And we need to figure out how we strongly we evaluate that. I mean, you know, whether we're going to buy the lost decade story or the seeds of the future story. And the third thing is that something that is really important that we hear actually in all three, but most strongly, I think, in in Paul's is that there's an internal dynamism which I contend works because it's what you call it, under the radar or something. <laughs> uh, it's that incremental change thing I was talking about. There's this internal dynamism, the, the entrepreneurship, 
the institution building, the changes in institutions, um, uh, the opening up, because even though Japan is always talked about as, you know, in terms of American trade reps anyway, are, are <laughs> they always say that, the, you know, the Japanese are keeping everything out and stuff. But in fact, there's, these are three things that, that continue, continue now. So I'm asking, how do we see, well, let me ask two questions. Are we thinking that what Meiji did was then and now is now, so there's not much continuity? That's one question. The second question is, how do you evaluate these three factors, Japan and the world, uh, the, uh, the sense of uncertainty, and this constant tweaking and mending and hemming of institutions that goes on all the time? So I guess I'm asking both a then and a now question. So how, how do you evaluate those three in terms of, of importance? Judge, I, I can maybe yeah. just jump quickly <laughs> back in. Um, you know, I, I think that, and some of this has been touched on, I think that the, the social kind of sense in the Meiji period, the kind of social consensus, and the idea that there was a goal I mean, again, I don't think it's just catch up, maybe modernization. Um, it was a little bit like there was this industrial revolution party had started. Uh, Japan had missed the first couple of hours of the party, but it was going on for a long time. And Japan joined the party and really threw itself in there with vigor um, and excitement. And I think that sense a little bit, Carol, has been lost in you know, Japan of today. A little bit of it's, it's, a, you know, it's all working in a sense. It, uh, it's you know the, the level of social capital in Japan is just you know incredible. Every time you know I go to Japan, I I, you know, I see things. I've you know been going to Japan for too long for to, I want to admit to. <laughs> uh, let's call it forty six years. Uh, I lived there for seventeen years. But every time I go back, went back a few months ago, you just see things and you marvel at them. The social order, the the, the preservation of this social capital. So that part, I think, is, is something that's sort of run through. Sometimes that social capital went off the rails a little bit. Won't go into the detail of that, but you know, earlier in this last century. But it, it's really been something that's run through the whole fabric of Japanese society. And maybe to, to a large extent sort of sets it apart because it just, you know, Japan just works, works so well. But I do think there's been somewhat of a loss of what do we do next? And what is the sort of common goal uh, that society can sort of uh, cohere around and and sort of put some energy into achieving. But and I think just if I had one thing, which just um, and maybe this is sort of part of our job on this panel. I think the Japanese themselves, this social capital idea. There's so many good things. Japan has so many great assets, you know, societal assets, technology assets, um, you know, civilizational assets, you know, artistic, the Japanese aesthetic. But Japan, I, I've noticed two things. One is Japanese consistently kind of like underrate themselves and play themselves down. When I tell my Japanese colleagues how great Japan is, they say, oh, really? Really? I didn't realize that. <laughs> and secondly, perhaps not uh, explaining themselves and being assertive enough in, uh, in explaining themselves to the rest of the world and sort of engaging through communication. Well, that really leads to, for, to Chelsea. You should be next because you were talking about that. How Japan? Uh, I mean, I think of what the Japanese government has, has been doing for the last few years with promoting cool Japan. I mean, it, it, you know, that's it, a lot of a, a lot of uh, effort and 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 money behind that. But what do? How do you see this? This um, from the point of view of art? This the. Um, the kind of communication with the world that you were talking about. I mean, I, it's unclear to me how, how you might see that because this, um, this in, incredible wooden uh, structure mm -hmm. is maybe not so forward looking. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. So how do you see it? Well, actually, there's a TED-Ed video that my kids showed me about can you build a skyscraper with wood? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then it's talking, and then in the, in the news, they were actually saying that this structure is um, has considerable fireproof qualities to it. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> they didn't divulge what the secret was, or maybe I, I just couldn't understand. But um, 
So I feel like, you know, there is this kind a kind of value added in the arts and in kind of the things that attract people to Japan. Like you say, every time you go, there's something really whimsical or just really creative, a creative solution to a small but really annoying problem or sometimes to a really large problem. And so I think that maybe when we, that I do see this connection in, in you know the arts and world's fairs from Meiji period to now that maybe some of this where this throwing yourself into the party with vigor and excitement wait we can still find it is in the arts and so that's why I think young people from every continent are uh, you know you will find young people you know from every area that are really interested in and in inspired by Japanese culture Japanese arts uh, media you know uh, animation and so uh, maybe this is this is Japan's way, Japanese artists' way of um, supplementing the communicative process. Where you say that that, that there could be a better effort in kind of um, you know communicating you know with the outside world. Maybe the, you know there's this there's, there's nonverbal intelligence, right? And so perhaps. Uh, what we see here is a kind of nonverbal form of communication that can be quite handy in moments of crisis or moments of, of tension. Uh, and, and that's why it's, it is a powerful continuity from Meiji to now, I think. That's interesting. So you're putting the, that what, while the government is, is pushing cool Japan uh, ad nauseum, um, the, <laughs> The artists are doing something different. They're very, mm -hmm. they're not doing this first rate country thing. Mm -hmm. they're, they're actually communicating with their art and they are global. And a lot of times it's right, the, it's the uncertainty, the dark side of things, right? That's that, that are, are, that artists are really good at um, articulating, right? Don't you find that? Yeah. And that's why a government effort maybe or a cultural, uh, a large institution will always have trouble keeping up with, say, like youth trends, right? Because, you know, kids are smarter than that. And they're going to, you know, they're always going to be a few steps ahead and kind of, they have a problem, they have a Naomi, a kind of worry inside them because of how they see the, wor the, the world's problems. And they can find their own solutions or answers to that problem, or even just a, a pin ex ex expression of the problem mm -hmm. in the arts, I think. And then that provides uh, a solace to them, or at least a way of thinking and moving forward. And it's received all over the world. Japanese yeah. artists, I mean, there's, they don't have to sell it. I mean, they don't yeah. have to push it. Yeah. It's, it's, part of the, the, it's part of the synchronicity yeah. um, that, you talked, that, that, uh, that you talked about uh, across Asia, but globally. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Taco? Is this, are we still in this, I mean, whatever former Prime Minister Abe said, um, he said a lot of things, um, the, where, Look, Japan is shrinking. You said so. It's going to be overtaken by Germany and India and Indonesia and all of these countries. So it, it, it went into, into shock when it became the, the world's third economy. Uh, they, they had, you know, headlines like Japan is sinking into the sea. You know, I mean, they were very upset. Anyway, so but Japan is not going to be the, the third or fourth or fifth largest economy. How do you gauge this question of, of the status question? Will, it, will the status question, maybe it's the status question and the synchronicity question will, will slide past one another. There'll be greater synchronicity and less, you know, mm -hmm. high pecking order. What do you think? So um, I think right now Japan is fourth in nominal. Um, I'm checking with Paul. And, but I think what's been more shocking is that in terms of per capita, GBP I think is where the lowest among the G7 and 30th overall. And that is not something that we think about every day, but I think that's how Japanese people think when they travel. And, they, um, and that maybe we're just a sense that we're getting poorer maybe. And, um, and that might be leading to, well, Japan is a really comfortable place to live and we can improve ourselves domestically. And what's wrong with that? And I think that's what the older generation tends to think. Why not the younger generation try to get out of the comfort zone? Um, to do other things. Well, part of it from the point of view from the younger generation is Japan is not expanding. We don't feel very rich when we go to other countries, but Japan is just so stable and comfortable and you don't have to pay a high price for the comfort that we get. And that's kind of leading to people not reaching out. But having said that, I think it tends to be overstated <laughs> that I think there's more, um, one, um, in terms of artists. I'm not, I'm not art 
person at all, but I've been amazed by working with um, Asia Society Japan that we feature a lot of young artists and they're very global and they do it on their own. They're very connected, they're very appreciated, very well known globally. And so that is one thing. And there's certain things about Japan that gets noticed. And I think some of it is interestingly in like the video games that tend to actually have like a dystopian view. Mm -hmm. And there's actually very interesting connections with the world that we're seeing and not in the ones that's necessarily promoted by the Japanese government. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing, that there's more synchronicity. And the rank thing is kind of tricky because there's something about the aggregate that maybe people care for status, but there's also something about at the personal level, they're not feeling as they want to go out. And I think if there's something that we should maybe not learn, but which I think people, I would want people to be more fascinated by looking at these exhibits and whatnot, is the imagination mm -hmm. and the um, ambition that um, the people had that, that's so clear from the works. And I'm plugging this because um, I work for Asia Society. It's the area of Japan this year. And the, um, the theme is ambitious reimagination. And I think it's the theme is that because I think that's what we see to be lacking in Japan. And I hate to be pessimistic. If it's, I lived in New York for five years. I love New York, but it's also very nice to be living in Tokyo mm -hmm. for the reasons that you raised. But I do think what is lacking might be ambitiousness mm -hmm. because there's, there's a sense that Japan is shrinking. So it's not like an obvious thing to be ambitious. And maybe reimagination thinks things are just so perfect in Japan. Why do you need to reimagine? But I think that's what's necessary going forward for Japan. I, I would I would agree with, with actually with all of you, but I'll, I'll, let me just say two things quickly. One, there's no question that the level of innovation mm -hmm. and and corporate mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneurship is in a lull. Okay, I mean I don't have to give you the examples, but this is not the this is not the Japanese um, uh, uh, innovative sector of the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen again, but it is not happening now. Um, so that's what you, one of the things that you actually are talking about when you say there's no goal there. There's no, but so, I, and I, I think, I think it has to do with this high value put on social stability and not wanting to, I mean, I, 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 it, it's not just the comfort, it's the not wanting to make waves. Japanese, uh, they didn't really make a lot of waves during the early years of the recession in the 1990s because they didn't want to make a lot of social upheaval. But the second thing I want to say is that, you know, I don't know many countries where the youth have a goal right now. Hmm? That's what I mean about a time of transition. I mean, where, where they're going. I don't mean individuals. I mean, you know, that we wanted this to happen in the world. The, the single exception to that is probably climate um, in terms of, of animating. And there, the Japanese youth are with you, are with the others on that. Um, so let's say that um, that the the pieces are shifting. I think I think the first rate country, maybe not in the in the um, GDP sense, but maybe in the cultural sense, uh, they certainly in the artistic sense, and maybe the 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 the, the kind of slowness now, this, this sort of, this quiet, this seemingly quiescent period is, is um, as I said, may go on for a while, uh, but it's got a lot of, there's a lot of things bubbling there, and the, they're bubbling in, synchron, it's in synchrony with other places. So it's going to change, Japan's place in the world is going to change, I think you're saying that. Uh, do I think Japan's economy is going to fall into, you know, some sort of deindustrialized whatever? No. No, I mean, I give you the robots, right? Um, then you can have the robots. <coughs> the, um, so I would like now to thank you all and, and to open the, um, the floor to questions for anyone. Please say, say uh, who you are with the microphone and who, whom you're addressing your question to. Otherwise, we'll all talk at once. <laughs> yeah. Um, my name is Stephen Lovebell. I'm a common citizen. <laughs> I heard about six months ago that uh, Mitsui Agrochemical actually appointed a woman to a top managerial position. And uh, can you speak some to the position of women in Japanese society uh -huh. and the economy now and what you see happening in the future? 
You hit the sore spot. How, how, how did you know? <laughs> how did you know that Japan is 123rd out of 135 in the World Economic Forum Gender Index? Uh, who wants to enter that? You want to answer that? Topic? I guess not me. Um, Ahako? I think the um, the gender index is still what it is right now. But I hate. I would. Although we are, when you think about the I'm gender index. be optimistic. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. No, Go. No, no, no. It's just that the gender <laughs> index-wise, we're very educated, the Japanese women, like compared to men. The lacking is the politicians and women in management. And the politicians is one other issue, but just you raised the management um, point. I do think that I, if I were to be optimistic, um, the people who enter the workforce after 1985, that is when the, um, the gender equality law kicked in, are reaching government uh, management positions. Just yesterday, the, um, the, I think the new CEO, was it, of Japan Airlines has been announced, and it's a she. And so I do think the people who entered under the new law is where we are, and we see a lot more people in management. I wish it happens faster, but I do think that, um, right. and, because it's not that everybody continued. And it might be happening a little bit slower than men, but I, I do think that things are changing, and I think the, like unexpected things that might help. My one thing, if you think about maybe 20 years from now in the management position, or maybe sooner, is that um, COVID had an unexpected effect mm. of men actually coming home for dinner. And Imagine lots of wives that. didn't know what to do about that. <laughs> but at the same time, there's more, it, there has always been a push for men to take paternity leave and not just to have the childcare issue to be dumped on women. But I think the COVID thing changed people's working patterns both in that men are coming home, and also there's options to work from home. So I do think socially, there has been an unexpected shock. We might propel things a little bit faster than otherwise. So I have nothing good to say about COVID, obviously, because I was here when it happened. But I do think that we do see changes in gender roles and think of management, and that we already see some cases of success, not like as a token success, but actually something that's been building up over the past couple of years. And I agree, and I'll give you, I'll give you the factor that I think is really good, is already changing things. This is womanomics, right? Uh, the fact is that J Japan's workforce is shrinking, and guess who they're gonna have to hire? <laughs> and they already are, and that's what Pri former Prime Minister Abe right, acknowledged, yeah. and that's what, so it, they're still pushing more babies, which never works, right? Uh, but the fact is that, that, that women are making progress, and they're, and they're absolutely necessary. Uh, even though there's resistance and, and these older people you talk about are still there, they eventually won't be there. So, yes, there is, there, there is, two of all of us, uh, the, um, uh, there, the, it, the, it is changing. It's changing slowly, that's my point anyway, about how change happens. But there's no question about this push factor of the uh, shrinking population. They can't afford to run the economy only with men, and they can't afford to run the economy only with Japanese. Mm -hmm. This is a big change, right? Next question? Yes, here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my name is Ariel Russo. I am a former resident of Japan, long-time resident. <clears throat> I have an economic question. First, three months ago in this very room, there was a presentation of maybe three or four investors from Tokyo assuring the American investors in the audience that Japan is opening up companies are trying to be transparent, etc. because Japan always had a big, big issue about that. In yesterday's Financial Times, there was an article, it was reported, that the company that runs the Japanese stock exchange uh, some time ago had sent letters to, I don't remember how many companies, maybe 1,600 Japanese companies, for them to present uh, plans for transparency to become more efficient, etc., And they were pretty uh, shocked to find out that still the majority of those companies that they send letters to have not even replied. <laughs> so it's, Japan may change, but the old, the old way still endures. I, it's, it's typical of Japan. Being a resident it's, the old, it's the old new thing, <laughs> right? The whole, the old, yes, yeah. exactly. What about Paul? Well, um, If you take, uh, so you're talking, I think you're focusing here mainly on, on corporate governance um, issues. If, again, if you look at this last 30 years, there have been 
tremendous changes that have taken place. And, you know, th I, sometimes I use a, this metaphor analogy of this sort of duck. You see a duck on a pond, it doesn't seem to be doing very much, but below the water line, it's, it's, it's going like this. It doesn't, you can't see that. But then you take your eyes off, you look back another minute or so, and it's, where's the duck? It's <laughs> over the other side of the pond. So there has actually been tremendous kind of this incremental change in Japanese corporate governance. Um, now, for example, if you look at the shareholding structure of Japanese companies now, um, it's, it's been dramatically transformed. The, the traditional, the system that emerged in the post-war period of sort of interlocking shareholdings um, has, hasn't completely disappeared, but it's, there's been a massive reorientation, restructuring of shareholding away from companies holding each other's shares. Now, why did they do that? Largely to protect the top management. Why did they want to do that? So that you could sustain the lifetime employment system. Because if you have a very active sort of competitive market for corporate control, hostile takeovers, it's very difficult to operate a Japanese-style employment system because you can't really offer these implicit long-term contracts. Come and join us out of university, work you know, all hours of the day and night, and eventually you'll get promoted and you'll, we'll look after you because the top management will not be able to enter into that, that kind of credible commitment. So that system's largely been kind of dismantled, um, although it's still, obviously, there's still pretty stable employment relations. But has, has this process led to a, a US-style, very sort of uh, active, hostile uh, market for corporate control? No, it hasn't. Um, again, it, it's, it's this, it speaks to this issue that it's pretty easy to issue top-down edicts. So corporate governance was a big focus of the uh, Abenomics, for example. But, you know, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink. So you still need, you know, the embedded behavioral patterns to change. But, you know, I think they are changing. And if you look at the, just take a, you know, a very simple indicator where the rubber hits the road of the stock market level, again, like a little bit like the duck, um, without noticing it too much, yeah. the Nikkei is now at about, what is it, 33, 34,000, maybe 35, 36. I haven't checked the last few days. I can remember not too long ago, well, you know, in the last 20 years, when the Nikkei broke below even 7,000 yen. And one of the things that market watchers like myself have been looking at for many years is, well, two things. When will the Nikkei break out of its post-bubble trading range? That is, it goes up, it goes down, goes up. The top of that level for, many, for a few decades, a couple of decades, was about 22, 23,000. As I said, now it's broken out. The second metric is when will it regain the, the bubble high, which is about 39,000? Well, we're not too far away from it now. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the idea that nothing is changing with corporate governance, the, orient, the way in which Japanese management manages their companies, um, is, is not really correct. But um, again, it comes partly to this communication issue. You know, send a, a questionnaire to a company and it'll probably end up in the, in the waste paper bin. They, they didn't even read the letters, I tell you. Then not, <laughs> I'm guessing. Uh, next question, please. Back in, in the back there, Mike. Hi, thank you all so much. Um, my question is also economic, so it's for Paul. But you know, I'm sort of inspired by what everybody said, uh, especially looking at these wooden structures, right? That look to me like the Crystal Palace in terms of the World's Fair, right? I'm using a wooden traditional. A wooden Crystal Palace. <laughs> exactly. Um, sort of arcade, right? Um, and talking about synchronicity, you know, it's sort of the opposite, right? Where we saw Britain exploding right at that time. Well, now we're seeing depopulation and a huge amount of vacancy in Japan with a shrinking population. So I mostly want to ask, you know, is there a chance of a real estate implosion or explosion like we saw in China that could affect the rest of the world? Or like with Greece, which was, you know, exterior, uh, the impetus with exterior. And what would it look like if so? Thank you. I think that was for me to start with. Well, in terms of a real estate implosion, um, unfortunately, we had that uh, with the unwinding of the bubble in the 1990s. Um, you know, so we had the 1980s, particularly the second half of the 1980s. Real estate prices went through the roof in Japan. 
um, looked like Japan was conquering the world and you know, Japan is number one, although that had been written a little bit earlier. And I just, you know, Carol mentioned something before, I think that Japan was sort of panicking because it was sort of becoming number three or number four. I think they were panicking when it looked like they were number one. Um, I don't think Japan really had the, you know, w wanted to embrace that. I think Japan's a little bit more comfortable down at you know, four, five, six. Um, real, that real estate bubble in the 1980s and then the unwinding of that bubble, which was a real estate bubble and was also a stock market bubble, as I just mentioned with the Nikkei, um, was you know, a devastating sort of deflationary force on the Japanese economy that took, you know, 15 or, or more years to sort of bottom out. But, you know, the Bank of Japan and the fiscal authorities um, are still kind of dealing with the aftermath as we speak. I mean, we still have, you know, the Fed now has hiked interest rates to 5.5%. Bank of Japan's still stuck at zero. So, you know, we're all waiting for, is that going to move off? So I wouldn't worry about um, a real estate price bubble deflating in Japan because it, we haven't had a real estate bubble. Could it go in the other direction? Well, I hope so, um, to a certain extent. I'd love to see a bit of a, a, a exuberance coming into the real estate market. But the demographic headwinds are against that, obviously. But just to speak a little bit to that demography issue, um, you know, I think, and we talked about womenomics before as well, there is a, solu a, a partial solution here, which is already happening, mm -hmm. but which is the immigration issue. And I, you know, kind of been saying this for years, and it's not for me to tell Japan what immigration policy it has, it should have. But if Japan wants to grow, if it wants to avoid this shrinkage, um, if it wants to revitalize, embracing an immigration policy and strategy that the Japanese themselves conceive that meets the Japanese needs would be a very good thing to do. It's sort of happening. It's sort of happening, okay. but it's you know, it's 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 not being articulated, um, it's not being thought out, and the potential complementarities. For example, if you are Carol as a policymaker worried about the very low fertility rate, the birth rate, which is what one point three ish or something like that, way 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 below replacement level, and it did get up for a while, about one one point four five, stepped down again. Um, but you also want women, half the population, and therefore having half the brains, to be fully more. fledged or more. Okay, um, <laughs> you're, you're on the record with that. Um, to be much more involved in in driving Japanese society and economy, which is a good thing. But you know, how do you get those two th two things together? Well, you know, having more immigration that will help women and men have families and participate in the workforce is one of the ways to do that. So the shrinking population, um, Japan is aging gracefully. Um, you know, it will obviously have an eroding effect over time, but there are ways of dealing with it. And on that note, most of, most of what's been said tonight has been very encouraging. Um, I hope that they're listening. Whoever it is in charge here. Uh, so I want to thank all of you because I thought that your presentations were wonderful. I thought you did justice to the Meiji period and 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 to the exhibit that Chelsea and and uh, and her colleague have have bequeathed to us. And thank you for coming and staying and braving the night. And wish you all a good night and a safe travel home. <laughs> thank you.